All right, everybody, welcome back to the Real Estate of Mind show. We are your host, Glenn and Amber Schwarm. Hello, everybody. Where we help everyday people create wealth through real estate investing. And our guest today does just that. She actually is uh, helping a lot of real estate investors be able to create wealth, be smart with their money, uh, be their own banker, I do believe, and yeah. all that. So I am looking forward to diving in, getting to know her a little bit today. So we have Amanda Neely here. from. She's also on a podcast. She runs with Grandma's Wealth Wisdom. I said that right without tongue twisting or whatever it is. So yeah, good. you did great. <laughs> well, well for, first off, welcome. Yes, glad, to, welcome. Glad, to, glad to have you, Amanda. Yeah, glad to be here. Um, thanks for having me. So um, it was probably about seven years ago that we came across the idea of um, banking on yourself and decided um, it made a lot of sense to us. Um, and we had no clue at that point that this idea was something that our grandparents did back in the 1940s half of americans had whole life insurance policies and were using them to pay for cars and weddings and all kinds of things and it's kind of become less conventional but it, it truly is the traditional way to do things what yeah. our grand my my grandma my grandpa would have done I love oh. that pun, banking on yourself. Oh yeah, no, it's no very, very good stuff. Yeah. So tell us about you before we get started, because I think you were a business owner before you got into this line of work, right? I mean, I, you're still independent. I think work for yourself, but this is. Yep. Tell us, tell us about uh, your previous life, because we're lifelong entrepreneurs. A lot of our listeners are either entrepreneurs or thinking about becoming entrepreneurs. So let's talk about that. Yeah, I had no clue the word entrepreneur until my husband came up with a business idea. We were married for one year <laughs> when he came up with the idea. And my first reaction was no, we were both in our cubicle jobs. You know, we had fi we were young, newlyweds, wasn't going to happen. And over time, as I started looking at what business does and how it operates, um, I'd, I realized more and more it was for me. And we wrote our first business plan in 2008. Three years later, in 2011, we opened an independent coffee shop in downtown Chicago, and we operated it for seven years, went through all of the guts and and some glory of what that uh, process looked like. Because when we started, we were still in student debt. We had no rich uncle. We didn't have any money to get going, but we were determined. We thought it was part of our destiny to do this. Amanda, you just brought up a very interesting point. If you don't mind, I'm going to ask you a little bit of a personal question that's not in not to do with banking. Um, a lot of our listeners totally. are either beginner investors or they're people that want to be investors. And so you just made a comment a second ago that your husband brought that idea to you and you immediately said no. But then as you started diving deeper into it, you realized that you were an entrepreneur. What do you think happened in your yeah. mind at that time that shifted you? Good question. Yeah. So actually I know exactly when um, it happened that I was like, I need to be open to something different. And it was, so I was working as a grant writer for a nonprofit and I would go to people who had resources and I would uh, ask them for money to do really important work in communities where people did not have resources. And my first site visit, I was dressed all in my fancy suit, taking other people in their fancy suits to a neighborhood community center to see the program that they were helping fund. And I was standing there, we were looking around the place and I realized in my heart that the people in that community were my people. It wasn't the people that I had come with. And I wanted to do important work for more of a grassroots level. And when, and that was like, I realized like I grew up in poverty. My parents were in public assistance and I was born. So that kind of identity of um, having been poor and being able to identify with people that had a lack of resources that I realized that was part of who I was. And I needed to dig into that more. Yeah. And when I did, when I said, okay, this, there's something here, I realized that the way communities change isn't through nonprofit work, although nonprofit work is really important, does some really good things, but it's really through those small, local, independent businesses. They're really the cornerstone of our communities. Mm -hmm. They're the people that donate to the school, you know, every single year, not just right. come in and do one program, right? Um, they're the people that know what the community really needs because they're part of the community. And I wanted to be in their, their shoes rather than coming in from outside and telling people what to do. Wow, great story. How do you yeah. think what, one of the biggest obstacles that we hear from people is, you know, maybe like you said, you had that job, you, you and your husband both had jobs in cubicles. So you have that steady paycheck, that steady job. 
how did you make the transition from saying, all right, I'm ready to walk away from knowing I have a paycheck coming to being an entrepreneur and not knowing where your next paycheck was coming from? Yeah, jump, it was definitely, yeah, it was definitely, in, sorry. I said jump and the net will appear. Maybe, <laughs> um, but we actually did it in some stages. Um, there was actually a time um, where I went to this women's retreat and I really like had this um, reaction to one of the talks at this retreat that I, I felt something in the spiritual realm telling me to leave my job. And I was like, no, 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 can't do this. I actually like tried to get away from everybody else that was there so that no one would like talk to me and like confirm it or just you know, whatever. Um, and I'm like bawling my eyes out because I, I was just really scared. And um, talked to, ended up talking to a couple people about it and they're like, well, but they didn't say when to leave your job. And I was like, good point. I sure I'm going to leave my job. I'm going to pursue this business, but it could be months or years from now, who knows? And then the next week, my nonprofit, this was 2009 when the nonprofit sector finally got the, the, uh, impact of the great recession, yeah. my company announced layoffs okay. and I just, I couldn't stop thinking they're going to lay somebody else off. And then I'm going to quit in a few months, maybe to go start this wow. journey. You know, somebody that has a mouth, you know, mouths to feed and it's just my husband and I. So at that point I left my cubicle, but my husband stayed in his okay. and it wasn't until we opened and we're in, like, we were kind of doing the side hustle kind of thing. I still did a little babysitting as a barista at another coffee shop for a while, right. Just to get some extra income, sure. but we bootstrapped our business. And then even when we opened, my husband still tried to work part-time to keep that steady salary coming in and he just couldn't do it. So it was a few months later that he made the jump too. The, you know, our, our, our um, podcast name is a real estate of mine. Cause we believe as we teach students about real estate investing, it's all about, we believe it's, you know, 80, maybe 90%, maybe 95% mindset and it's yeah. five or 10 or 20% what you do, the mechanics of it. Yeah. And as I'm hearing your story, Amanda, you know, I appreciate you being so honest and vulnerable and say, look, I was crying. And I, yeah. cause I, we've all, if as an entrepreneur, we've all been there, but you were crying out of fear, but you pushed through that. So first I want to say good for you yeah. like that. Not a lot of people push through that horrible, that fear is real. It, it yeah. it's, it's actually not real. It's all in our head, but it feels very real at the time, right? It feels very real at the time. And then you still push through us. I, I just want to say before we dive into the kind of stuff that you do now, I just want to say congratulations. I think that so many people get to that point where they are so scared, they're crying, and they actually go back in their comfort zone. They climb back in their cubicle, so to speak, of life, and they don't ever leave it. And it's just funny how life, life, it's funny how life unfolds, yeah. isn't it? Like that was a pretty, that was also a, 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 an <laughs> awesome move on your part to say, if you're going to lay somebody off, I was just thinking the same thing. Why like, well, like, well be me? Like you didn't, you, you took the sword, you're going up, you know, you could have, you could have very easily protected your own hide and for, said to heck with the other yeah. person, but you didn't. You yeah, did you're not, you're yeah. a good person. Yeah, yeah. that's and, for sure. I mean, it goes back to the mindset, right? That my parents instilled in me from when I was a little kid, my mom teaching me, I could do anything I, I set my mind to, right? That there was no limit. And my dad teaching me the work ethic and the values um, to, to, you know, you, you're to be a good person. And, um, I ended up because I raised my voice, they couldn't actually lay me off. I couldn't get any kind of severance or unemployment. I had to submit my resignation. So I gave up all of that too. I had no clue. I was doing that when I raised <laughs> my hand and said, Oops. you know, me, <laughs> yeah. uh Oh, <laughs> that so, wasn't, wasn't quite the way you planned that probably. But. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. So how, now that you have a, the perspective of both, you're, you're an entrepreneur and you used to work in a, a regular cubicle nine to five job. Um, how has your mindset shifted? I mean, what are the pros and cons? I'm curious, yeah. as, as you answer that, what was your exit from that business? Because you got out before COVID, I think, if I'm looking at the right. dates. Which, yeah. Thank, um, thank God, probably right. But I, yeah. But, but yeah, yeah I'm just curious if you had an exit or you shut down or just curious. And then, and then, uh, then back to Amber's question with the mindset, because that's all part yeah. of it. So we actually sold the business. Uh, we ended up, so we were such a business that was organized for a social mission prior to making a profit. So we sold to a nonprofit actually to do oh, some oh, job wow. training that they were doing. Oh. Um, so, and they, um, it was really great for us to like, they're continuing that mission and that legacy. That was really why we wanted to start the business anyway, to impact 
you know, people with less resources and help them get to a better place. Did they make it through, um, the, they make it through the pandemic or are they still fighting through? So actually, <clears throat> Um, we were also pregnant at the time. So that was a big uh, oh. reason to sell the business and you sure. know, do a transition. And on our son's first birthday, they, the landlord had told them they needed to be out of the building. Okay. And so that was April, 2019. Yep. And it's taken them. So city of Chicago, lots of legal, you know, things to jump through with the health department and everything. They're just now reopening. Um, okay. in their, well, it's, not, they, it's not bad though. Good. Right. Right. So, okay. Well, that must make um, you feel good. This something you started is still continuing right. on. Good. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and really as a nonprofit that had been around for 20 years, had some really big donors, they were able to restart with us with a one-year-old that would have been yeah. impossible for us. Right. Yeah. So congratulations on the baby. Thanks. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, you're, you've had lots of changes in your life in the past few years, huh? Yes. Lots yep. of stuff going on. So why, yeah. why would someone want to become an entrepreneur instead of staying at their full-time job? Yeah, there's so many things that um, I think when someone starts to like tinker with entrepreneurship, they'll see in themselves if they have what it takes to be an entrepreneur. Um, my number one thing is a sense of like destiny or purpose or calling or whatever you want to call it that gives you that impetus to like really go after it. I think there's, a, if you start down an entrepreneurial path, there'll be so many times to turn back, to, mm -hmm. to, to give in, um, like times when you're crying uncontrollably that happened multiple times, not just at the very beginning there. Oh yeah. Um, we know. And yeah. <laughs> so each time that you see, like, or each time you come to that place, if you've got that sense of destiny or calling or purpose behind you, you'll continue to move forward. You said, I can't give up on this. Whereas like you could be an employee, you could do an okay job. Right. But you don't, you get your, maybe your purpose and meaning is just to provide for your family. And that's awesome. Yep. Right. But that's not going to keep you at that job. That just keeps you in a job. Right. right. So very different for entrepreneurs. We often like feel like if no one fulfills this need, um, like it, it has to be me. No one else is going to do it. I right? love how you opened that up and you talked about, um, you know, you, once you start it, you kind of know quickly if it's for you or not. I'm thinking about my son. Our son went to, you know, he's 21 now, but back, uh, he was probably 14, 15. He went to. Oh, I know what you're gonna say. Play football. Football camp. <laughs> he went to. He had to go to football camp. He he wanted to try it. And I had never. I grew up in a small town. We didn't have football. Our bodies are made for football. We're short and stocky. And so, he's like, Yeah, I think I want to try that. So I said, Yeah, let's give it a shot. You know, and all this. There's all kinds of controversy about football, right? All the all the uh, head injuries, head injuries and, yeah. and stuff. And so, um, so he goes to the, the camp, and I watched him a little bit. And they, the guy said, Well, your son's a really good runner. And one of the dads said, We'll know if it's for him when he gets his bell rung. And I said, yeah. okay. And then one day he said, I'm good, dad. And I said, <laughs> did you get hit hard? Nope. But I think he probably did. You know, I yeah. think he probably yeah. got his bell rung one day and went, yeah, so that's not the path I want to go on. So right. it's a, it's the same thing with an entrepreneur, right? Some yeah. people start on the path and get hit once and go, yeah, so maybe I'll go back to the nine to five. Maybe that's right. where I'll go. And so again, but then the, other people get hit and they're like, you know, their adrenaline gets pumped and they're like, all right, let's go. Yeah. Let's get yeah. back on that horse and or or you cry and then get back up, right? We all, <laughs> right. We've all got that where we're like, what am I doing? Am I losing my ever-loving mind? I'm still, what am I doing this for? Is, you know, but no, people don't stress like I'm stressed. But if your why is strong enough. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. mentioned that having a purpose and a passion, we call it, in our business, we call it the why, yeah. right? The why that drives us. And, um, you know, for us as our family, it has to be something that's really deep down inside of you that makes you get up when you get knocked down again. Cause mm -hmm. that's, you know, you, you're a shining example of that. Just hearing your story today has really been inspiring to me just to hear that. Cause it's, it's just nice to know there's more of us out there, right? There's not, there's, there's, there's a lot these days, but there's, you know, people that start stuff, but they don't really finish it. Right. So right. a lot of them. So you're so still that, here. That kind of brings us back full circle to the quote that you started with, or the saying that you started with is banking on yourself. Why don't you talk a little bit about what that means to you? Yeah. So I'll take you two years into the business. We, um, uh, we met a really good, who's now become a really good friend, Mark Willis. He's been a guest on your show before, I understand. Yeah. yeah. And he um, he had an office down the hall from our coffee shop. And we were doing oh. documentary screenings, you know, sharing world-changing mm -hmm. messaging. And he's like, I've got a documentary that I think would be good. And we're like, sure. 
we're looking for documentaries. Let's try it. And when the credits rolled in the documentary he chose, I was so mad at him that he had never told us what this documentary shared. And this, the documentary was all about uh, banking with life was the name of the, the documentary. Okay. And we like forced him to sit down with us. And that's when we realized we were on the edge financially and one little mishap, we would be filing bankruptcy, closing our business, doing whatever. Cause we had no cushion, no safety net. We, um, the first two years of our business, we lived on just the tips in the tip jar, about an hour, a dollar to $2 per hour. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's when he, um, really helped us think, start to think about what does it mean to pay yourself what you're worth, um, both now and your future self. Right. Yep. And a lot of my like why behind the business was always thinking about others, right? Helping the coffee farmers make a better wage, helping our community um, become more of a community and watching out for each other. And that was when I really started to turn in and say, yeah, but if I'm on the edge of poverty, how am I going to help anybody else mm -hmm. come out of poverty? Right. That's yeah. going to be yeah. even harder. 100%. Yeah. So that, that moment started me thinking about what does it mean to be true to myself not just my values and, you know, sticking with what I believe, but also with making sure I'm taking care of myself, the whole, like you put your oxygen mask on first before anybody else. So that's what initially attracted me to this idea. I also, I never really liked investing in the stock market that was outside of my control and maybe probably supporting companies that I wouldn't necessarily align values and beliefs wise with. Yeah. Um, I had, didn't have the money. I, you know, I, I didn't think to do anything like real estate or, you know, otherwise. And cause literally I was just in debt. I had zero net worth. Right. But that mindset shift to think about the long term, but keep it accessible for the short term as an entrepreneur, I didn't want my money locked up where I couldn't touch it. That's why I never contributed to an IRA or a 401k still had a little bit of a 403B from that nonprofit that I worked with, but I had no clue what to do with it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and he really helped us get a path together, a strategy together that would help us make sure we're taking care of ourselves now in the future and everywhere in between so that we could grow our business, but we could also retire one day. So I want you to continue on with that and how you can help people do that in the future or going forward here, but I want to give you a compliment too. You're obviously considerably younger than Glenn and I are. We're um, Glenn's in his fifties. I'm in my late forties. So, um, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, you know, and when we're young, I think almost all of us think that we know it all. And so I want to give you a compliment in that you were pretty upset with him at first for doing that documentary, but um, you at least stayed open-minded and, and realized that you didn't know it all and you, that you don't know what you don't know. And I think that the, the younger generation can really take from that. And then you also brought up a really cool point about, um, and, I, and I think this is something that's more awareness has been brought to is that, um, you know, being with companies that align with your values. Yeah. And, and that's, I think, really important. And I'm glad it's becoming more of an awareness in our society um, because I think that's going to make a, a, a healthier society. Um, so I just want to compliment you for, for having an open mind and, and looking at the opportunities instead of just saying, oh, I know it all. This is what I want to do. And, you know, I, I think some people get stuck in that and they're not going to get very far with that kind of mindset. So I hope that our listeners can um, learn from that. I think that you also work a lot with real estate investors. Am I correct? Correct. That's yeah. something you do. Let's, we should talk about it. Obviously, the, our audience is primarily either wannabe or soon to be. Let's call it, let's not call them one, but let's call them soon to be soon to be real yeah. estate investors. They're they're on that track, or they're starting on the path with us, or maybe there there's some seasoned folks listening too. So I'd be very curious to know what what that looks like. How can in your they world. bank on themselves? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Like so really, it's looking at first of all, what do you want your money to be doing for you, right? What's um, important about your goals, your dreams, your concerns, um, long term, and then aligning your money with those. So if we like to say, if you don't have a plan for your money, somebody else does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And particularly if you're get, just getting started or you're trying to get your money together to get started, to develop that strategy for what you're going to do with your money before jumping in all the way or before, you know, as you're jumping in, that can be 
a make or break kind of moment, right? Yeah. Um, you'll be less swayed by, you know, the the shiny, the you shiny know, object roll <laughs> over here, right? <laughs> um, and so I, I love uh, working with people in that capacity to help them get clear on what their goals and dreams are and how their money can align to help them fulfill those, particularly, you know, digging into what's your unique definition of financial independence. What, what is that going to look like for you? Yeah. It's not necessarily about retirement and hanging up your hat and not doing anything, but, you know, pursuing a passion or spending more time with family or whatever. What does that look like? What do you need to make that happen? And how do we make your, wherever you're at now, work toward that? So when Mark was in the show, we talked about it. Let me try and summarize the way I understand it. And then maybe you maybe you tell me if I'm way off base or I'm, I don't, I've am lost my mind, which is probably a whole different conversation. But so basically what bank on yourself means is that you're utilizing a whole life insurance policy to not only give you life insurance, um, obviously when you, for death benefits, but you're also using that as a way to um, build cash and then be able to borrow from the cash value of that policy and essentially pay yourself interest. So instead yeah. of borrowing from a bank for a car, instead of borrowing $10,000 for a vacation or whatever it might be, in our case, a little more, we have lots of kids. So um, whatever it might be, instead of paying a bank back 5%, 10% interest, whatever it might be, or in the case of a real estate investor, 10, 12, 14% to a hard money lender, you can, in theory, pay yourself back, and that interest will accrue and grow inside of your your, life, your whole life policy. The beauty of it, correct me if I'm wrong here, the beauty of it is that even if you've borrowed the money out of your policy, let's say you've got, for argument's sake, $100,000 in cash value in your policy, just to make math easy, and you borrow $100,000 and you're paying back, let's just say 10%, because you're going to borrow for a house and you pay it back at 10%, at the same time, that investment of $100,000 is also still earning interest in the market at, let's just say, 4% or whatever it might be, some, some you know, small nominal amount, but it's earning that money. So that money, in theory, is earning interest on both ends. Am I close? Am I way off base? Am I ready for a job? What, what's the deal? <laughs> yeah, you got it 99%. Okay. There's one word or like one phrase that you use that I want to be really clear about. You said um, that when it's like, even though you've taken that hundred thousand dollars out, it's still growing in the market as in like in the policy. One of the things I love about the companies that we work with is that it's not in the stock market. We're not oh. using anything. Oh, tied I, I did not to know that. that. Yeah. Um, so where is so it? <laughs> yeah, they so they do a bunch of different things to um, grow what they call the general fund, right? All the money that people have paid in as um, in this big pot that's growing. So of the general fund, about 70 to 80% is actually loaned out to companies to uh, develop new products or to build buildings. So uh, like the iPad was developed by Apple with money from a life insurance company. Um, much of like downtown Chicago, where I lived for a long time, was built by life insurance companies, like the tall buildings that you see. Um, so they're um, actively putting the money to work that way. Plus, it's being loaned out to other policyholders to go buy their cars or invest in real estate or do different things. Oh, okay. um, oh, okay. And then, so you know, the part of that fund. back is helping okay. grow the general fund. Yep. Okay. So here's a question that I have for you. Cause why we talked to Mark before, and I was curious of this for, for our listeners, let's, you can't, so you can't just say, well, Amanda, here's a hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to put in the account. Now it's not quite like that. You have to buy a policy. I'm assuming there's probably certain caps on how much you can put in. I would guess maybe I'm wrong, but please, educate us let us know yeah actually a few years back it, someone set the guinness world record for the most money put into a life insurance policy it was in the millions of dollars in terms of annual premium and it had to be split apart into three different companies to give the i think a billion dollar death benefit we don't know who this uh, life insurance purchaser was uh from what we understand, somebody in silicon valley my best guess probably elon musk or somebody like that so <laughs> I mean, you can imagine if you have yeah. that kind of net worth, that kind of income, yeah. you could totally do that. But it also we have people that start with a very small monthly premium of what they want to do, right? And um, from their cash flow and what actually works right. for them sure. with where they're at in life. That's how I started, right? I was right. still 
making two dollars in tips per hour. Right. Yeah. Um, every everybody starts with wherever wherever they are comfortable, right? If they want to put yep. fifty bucks a month, hundred bucks, five hundred, whatever the number is. But does it have to be a monthly fee, or can you put a lump sum in to start off with? And if you do, is there a max? How quickly can you, is your cash available? Because that's probably that's what most of our investors are going to say is if right. I. Just for an easy number, if I put a hundred thousand dollars in, and I'm a well, me, I'm a fifty-two year old healthy guy. How much cash is available right away? Eighty, ten, ten, ninety. You know, I wonder. You know, yeah. I mean, what that what yeah. that is. What we see is it's typically around eighty percent if you're doing that lump sum type uh, deal. So if you put in a hundred thousand, you might have eighty thousand. That's your initial value, but uh, that you could get access to as soon as the check clears the bank. You can submit a request um, to have that loaned back out to you. Okay. Um, and the sometimes that loss of liquidity, so to speak, right, of that 20000 is a big deal for people. Um, so a, a big common objection is, well, why don't I just put my 100000 go buy the real estate, especially sure. knowing what's coming. And then this year could be a really great real estate market. Um, and so we do pay attention to timing wise. And each person makes their decision in terms of what timing is most important to them. Um, I've had very similar people. Some decided I can't lose that 20% of liquidity right now. I'm going to wait and start later. And other people saying, no, that totally works for me. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping in right now. Um, and so part of why I share that is what we try to do. Remember at the beginning of the conversation is what are your goals and dreams and how do we align your money with that? Um, and so we never like force people to start right away, right? We let them know if you, if you don't think it's the right time, no, your health could change, you know, as you get older, insurance is more expensive, you know, all those kind of things. Yeah. Um, but right. If, if that loss of liquidity at the beginning is too much for you, you just have to know that you're taking a risk that way too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause I think about it, like in our own personal situation, we have a lot of term life. Like that's a lot. We have, I have a lot of term life for, you know, just for my investors for backing if something were ever happen because we're kind of the, 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 you know, brains behind the operation. So we have term and then we keep our money invested in the, in the markets where we are. So it's a very interesting concept <laughs> that you have there. Liquidity is certainly always a, always a thing, but is it, is it worth the extra banking on yourself? Right. That's where, that's where it right. comes in because, because in theory you're growing faster, right? You're growing faster yep, with yep. that money because it's getting paid on both ends. Even, right. so even when it's not in use, it's in use. Right. Yep. And um, if you are investing in any kind of stock market, they always say invest for the long term. So you're losing liquidity anyway, right? If you're seeking that, in, uh, if you're, you know, buy term and invest the rest and you're using the stock market that way. Same with real estate. You buy a property, you lose some liquidity. You can't, um, you might not be able to sell it immediately, right? It could right. be a few months or a really great plan is to buy real estate and you know, have rental income and hold it for a long time and let it appreciate. Sure. Right. Um, so I think real estate investors are already, we you already know what liquidity, how important it is, but also to, when it makes sense to have a little slight loss of liquidity in order to get ahead long-term. Yeah. And so you just have to look at it that way. Well, it's a great, it's a great um, uh, vehicle for, you know, all, all of our listeners for sure, real estate investors to even start small to figure that out. But I think the more you can, the more you can have your money Work working for you. for you all the time. Cause I know with our case, we do, we do some hard money lending. And so if our money's in the bank, I'm making nothing, what mm -hmm. half percent, 1% of money markets, nothing, right. Just sitting there, even though I might you know, learn, learn out 12, 14%, I'm still, I have to wait till that moment arises. Right. And I'm pretty picky about who I put it with. So yeah. it's very interesting, interesting concept that you can do the same thing. Just have it in a, how, how, how quickly is that money accessible to you? A couple of days. So as soon as your check clears the bank, right, the money that you've put in, you can submit a request when the life insurance company receives it. It sometimes depends on how much, how many requests they're receiving at a time. Sure. Um, so we've seen it happen in as little as two to three days, um, but we typically say to aim for a week. A week. Okay. Yeah. To, yeah. For the for the funds to be transferred back in. All yeah. right. That's, that's certainly, that's certainly good. Uh, good to know. I think I think all of our listeners should really take heed and you know listen to this because I think it's the, like you said it's almost like building a rental portfolio right it takes time. We have yeah. some houses that we've not done well on. We have a couple now that we're actually turning over that it's a long story. We didn't do well on the on them. So we actually in the company said look it if we flip them now we're taking a loss. But 
let's sit on them. Let's turn them into Airbnbs. Let's get the cash flow going. So at least we have cash flow on them. And then in 10 years, it'll be worth it. You know, <laughs> so we had to play the long-term game. So I think that's important, right? For people. Yeah. Yeah. Amanda, how do people find you if they want to yeah. learn more? Yeah. So grandmaswealthwisdom.com is the best place to find us. Um, we're also on YouTube. Just look up Grandma's Wealth Wisdom. We've got a bunch of videos there. You might actually look for the playlist where we do bank on yourself FAQs uh, with frequently asked questions that people ask about oh. what this concept. And someone get, someone reaches out to you, they you're going to sit and talk to them with their own personal thing, right? You're going to have a conversation with Zoom or whatever you do, and you're going to have a conversation Yep. You do all that with them and look at their own personal situation. Because they might be saying, I don't have a hundred grand. What's Glenn talking about? Well, maybe it's not a hundred grand. Maybe it's 50 bucks a month, right? And it could be exactly. anything to start. And yeah. you can always change it as you grow, as your needs change, right? All that. But I think, correct me if I'm <clears> wrong <throat> on this, but life insurance in general, the younger you buy it, the cheaper it is. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 So um, what we actually do, most life insurance agents are going to try to get you the biggest death benefit possible because they're that's where their focus is. We want you to have the highest cash value possible. So mm -hmm. if you're, let's say you've got two individuals, one's 25 and one's 55, they put in the same amount of premium, they might have the same initial cash value. We just lower the death benefit for the 55 year old because we want that cash value to be equal. So even though like the cost is more in terms of the life insurance, we try to keep the cash value equal at the beginning there. Um, and it, it just means that the death benefit is lower the older you are. You know, there's really no downside to it. Like if you're looking, if you're weighing things on a pro and con, there's really no downside to yeah. it other than the liquidity of maybe that 20% that, and that's, you know, short term. Let me ask yeah. you this question. I'm gonna put you on the spot for a second. If you don't mind. <laughs> okay. you, Love it. you can take it. So I'm going to yes. do it. So there's been discussion. <clears throat> I've, I've seen discussion in some of the groups that I'm involved with, some of the mastermind groups and that kind of stuff. And the conversation is, is does this make sense financially? Or is this a really clever way to sell life insurance? No offense, <laughs> right. But right? We all got that. So let's talk. I mean, people right. who are listening might be thinking that. So let's talk about the it. The elephant let's, in the room. Yeah, let's talk about it. Like what? What? <clears throat> obviously, you're yeah. on the side of saying absolutely not. It's fantastic, but you've had to have had that objection. Oh yeah, for sure. When I first heard about this, I was super skeptical. While I was still mad that no one had ever taught me how banks work, you know, and stuff like that before. Um, and what it really boiled down to me is when I looked at what I wanted my money to do for me, right? Go somewhere where it's going to grow, but also be accessible in case I want to use it to grow my business, right? Or in case my business has a flood and I need to take a loan to, to, you know, cover the end, you know, make ends meet in the meantime, which literally happened. <laughs> um, totally use my policy for that. Right. I was thinking about what all, all of those, what ifs, and also, um, what was important to me, like that I did have liquidity. I wasn't locking it away. Um, and I can tell you, you're probably, you can probably get a better rate of return somewhere else. The whole life insurance does not have a super awesome rate of return. Um, but if it's not always about the rate of return, or if you have another place where you can use your money to get that rate of return, like real estate, um, it makes a lot of sense. So, um, what basically what I'm trying to say is if so you, let me ask you this, what you're yeah. saying, what you're saying is so maybe make sure I understand. So in other words, if you're not a real estate investor, for instance, if you, you wouldn't probably borrow money to go invest in a stock market, like you probably wouldn't do that. It wouldn't be a very, you probably could, but it's probably not the wisest move. I, right? it, it Actually, so back in March of 2020, the stock market had its worst three days in history, right? Yeah. Uh, in terms of decline. And I had clients that were prepared for that. They had sold a bunch of stock back in uh, December of 2019 when the stock market was really high. <laughs> they felt really good about it that they had sold it. You know, you sell high and they put it into a policy. They were ready. They took policy loans. They went and bought when it was low in the stock market, being sensible, right? Knowing sure. what that they have been tracking okay. over time. They're going to hold it for at least a year and a day so that it gets taxed as capital gains rather than as personal income. And then they're going to sell those stocks whenever they've made their investment, you know, that they wanted to make the return. They're going to put it right back into their policies. Okay. So people so do that all the time. So it's for people, so it's, and I don't mean, I kind of interrupted your train of thought. And I, here, I asked yep. a question, I interrupt you, but I'm just trying to, I'm just thinking what, what they might be thinking, because I'm thinking the same thing. Yeah. And that is, 
you have to have a to make this make sense you have to have another investing strategy rather than just life insurance correct yes and yeah yes and no or you have to be happy with maybe a three percent steady rate of return for the rest of your life on money you would normally like put in bonds or in a you know cds or a savings account right right um so you may not uh, put extra cash. Yeah, you may not put extra cash into it. You may just buy the because there's a way with with whole life you can buy the policy and not really have a ton of cash value. <coughs> It'll happen over time, yep. but not up front. Yeah, even if we compare putting five hundred dollars into a Roth IRA and buy, you know, in mutual funds or ETFs or something, and then five hundred dollars per month into a life insurance policy, they're kind of even. Sometimes the IRA is lower, sometimes the life insurance is lower, just depending on how the stock market's doing. But we see that they actually do really well. There's been independent research that's shown that the average investor only gets a little over 3% rate of return in their investments anyway. So that would make sense. Yeah. Um, But the, so the most important thing um, is that if you look at what you want your money to do for you. And you're, you're really truly honest about that. You have to then look at all the financial products out there, stock market, CDs, savings accounts, uh, real estate. And you have to say, which one of these aligns best with my values and And my most, (laughs) right. And my risk tolerance. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, and what we've found is that unless for, for like the majority of people that are, you know, not too, you know, high risk or not to, um, I need a 12% rate of return, right. If, uh, that have kind of, um, a really big expectations with what their money would do. Right. Um, they, that the whole life policy really aligns well with what they're doing it, when it's designed in this bank on yourself type way. Um, with the people that want a bigger return, you're saying. Right. <laughs> yes, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And um, there's actually, so Pamela Yellen is the lady who coined the term bank on yourself. She's got it trademarked and all that. And she's got bank on yourself.com. She actually has a hundred thousand dollar challenge. If anybody can find a better financial product than the, a bank on yourself designed whole life policy, she'll give them a hundred thousand dollars. That's how confident she feels about it. Okay. How about that? Is yeah. she the one that wrote the book Bank on Yourself? Yep. I read that this summer. I think after we, after Mark and I had our podcast, I read that book just to get a feel for the how, how it all works. So yeah, been a lot of dis, been a lot of discussion around our, our circles. So good. Listen, Good's listen, good. we we're running out of time. Do me a favor. Tell everybody again how they can reach you. How they can set up an appointment with you to come talk to you. You can get them on the right track to banking on themselves. Please tell, tell our listeners. Yep. Grandmaswealthwisdom.com or where it's Grandma's Wealth Wisdom is also a podcast or on YouTube if you want to look on your favorite app. And I always say that, and, and, and not me, but it's an expression, you know, people like to do business with people they know, like, and trust. And I think that you are easily someone people would know, like, and trust. I was, Thank you. That's I was the best compliment you all have given me. I had no idea I was going to be complimented so much today. Yeah. Well, well, you deserve it. Well, I think, <laughs> I think you're coming from, from, you know, lifelong entrepreneurs here that understand the struggle, understand, understand that the struggle is real. I always say that business is a blood sport. And so when yeah. you're out there and you've survived that, the, you we have instant mutual respect you know you yep. survive you build something from nothing and people that do that we're not we're not normal yeah so that's okay so it's yep. uh but yeah you, you've been great great guest here today so thanks so much for being here thank, thank you thank you for being here all right everybody, give, give a man a call she'll get you on the right path mm-hmm.